Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. This is Jeff Smith with The Growing Band Director, and I'd like to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Matt Dwyron, Director of Music Education at Western Connecticut State University. Matt, it's a pleasure to have you. I, I hope everything's going well for you at WestCon. I, it's wonderful, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Love, uh, love talking with uh, you know talking with old friends, and uh, it, you know reliving old good times, but also talking about all the great stuff that's going on now. Well, thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your public school and your graduate school and your time at WestCon? Absolutely. Uh, so I uh, did my undergrad at. Keene State College in New Hampshire, and I taught in Claremont, New Hampshire for a, a couple of years, uh, and, you know, some wonderful times there, a beautiful place, uh, met some, you know, some wonderful young men and women, a few of whom I'm still in touch with, and then I actually moved to Sanford, Maine, which was a community where I grew up, a community that had a pretty rich musical history. Uh, it was the home of former uh, timpanist with the Boston Symphony uh, Vic Firth, his dad was the first high school band director there, um, and I uh, spent the next 21 years of my teaching career as uh, director of bands and music teacher at Sanford High School. Uh, I was a fourth generation Sanford educator in my family. My great grandmother had been head of the math department there in the 30s, 40s, early 50s. Uh, my dad still taught there at the time that I uh, I was teaching, so we had six or seven years where We'd sit together at the first day of school meeting. Um, you know, it it uh, it was home for a long time, and I uh, you know, I learned an awful lot about how to be a good teacher, uh, how to be a caring person, how to work with people, and work with. Uh, I think over the course of my tenure, there are probably several thousand now music students who who went through. Um, we had a, I would say a. A, a overall pretty successful band program um, marched competitively in the fall. And, you know, if I'm really radically honest about that, we were, we were okay, but we were not setting the world on fire as a, a competitive field show band. We're very successful in the parade marching uh, field. We, we played, uh, we escorted dignitaries from Dublin in the New York city, St. Patrick's day parade. One year we played the first Obama inauguration. That was, that was a really big deal. Those were, uh, you know, those were really moving, meaningful times for, uh, for everybody. Um, the concert bands were, I, I would say, really sort of the, the shining beacon of that program. Uh, we had, uh, we had rehearsals and performances with, uh, with some, some big name people. Richard Floyd came up and conducted. Uh, we had Fred Finnell in actually twice uh, to work with the bands. Uh, worked with uh, Kurt Dupuy, who had been uh, the principal cornet player with the President's Own, coming in to do a, a master class and presentation for the kids. And it, it was it was a good, solid concert band program. At times we had a couple concert bands. At other times it was only one. Um, you know, I, I, I would say a big program in a big school for the state of Maine, but only by Maine state standards. We, you know, 13, 1400 students in the school and uh, at our big times, probably uh, 100 to 115 or 20 in the in the band program. Excellent. Um, it was uh, it was a great place to be. It was a great place to evolve as a teacher and learn and continue to grow. Uh, I did my master's degree at Southern Oregon University in the American Band College program over the course of three summers. I'd also say that was a really transformative experience because the the setup of the program was really pretty unique. A lot of the people who taught uh, came in as guest artists, and they would solo with the band that we put together that that you know given semester or summer. Um, and so 
you just you get a chance to hang out with people like the Dallas Brass or um, you know we had Johan Demay in one year conducting the groups, but we worked with Fred Fennell. We worked with several European uh, band conductors, Philippe Manglet, who ran the Coup de Vent Band Festival in La Havre, France. Um, and it was it was an opportunity to be working with people that, as a band director, you would go. I played all kinds of Robert W. Smith's music. And then all of a sudden, one summer, he's there conducting the band. And, uh, you know, you had rehearsals with him. You had master classes as he's teaching. But then you would hang out and go to dinner with these people. And, and so, you know, it just, it, you started to realize that while they were big names and famous in our field, they were also just real human beings. And, and you know, I really... I think I developed a lot of like feeling like, hey, maybe I do kind of belong in this brotherhood as I was going there and, and getting a chance to hang with some of those people. It was also fun to get street cred with the kids when you would come back in and they would be like, this Robert W. Smith piece was so fantastic. And it would be, actually, I was speaking with with uh, with Mr. Smith about that this summer. And it, oh, my goodness, you know, so it would, it was just it was. It was a lot of fun. It was a great way to be growing my own skills and knowledge while you know continuing to feel more and more like I, I belong at this this is this is not just what I do maybe it's who I am yeah so, that's great um so I taught there for 21 years and uh I also had the the wonderful opportunity to work with uh several adult groups uh I conducted the basketball band at the University of New Hampshire for five years that was a real charge because all of a sudden every kid who was in front of you played kind of like the stronger players in your high school band. And you went, whoa, this is, this is cool. Um, worked with some adult musicians uh, with the Portsmouth Symphony Orchestra for a little while and really for a long time, for 16 years with the Stratford Wind Symphony. Uh, and that big time helped me to grow my game because adults are stronger musicians than kids are. And all of a sudden, one of the pieces that I might be working with for half a year with my high school band was like one of the 12 pieces that we're doing in the concert next month with that group. And it really helped me grow a lot of knowledge on, you know, what are pieces in the literature that I can program really regularly, what fits well together. And, and really, all of a sudden, instead of doing good in-depth preparation on maybe 10 or 12 pieces in a year, now I'm in-depth prepping 40 or 50 pieces in a year and really doing a lot of score study and a lot of listening and a lot, you know, I, you, you get good at what you do. And all of a sudden I was doing an awful lot of music prep and conducting and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I found as my own children were getting older and getting ready to go off to college that I was feeling kind of hungry to want to grow my game again. And so uh, I had flirted with the idea of trying to make the move to be a university professor. Um, and in hindsight, I would say I knew next to nothing about what that really means and, and what you need to do. I'm a, I'm a good band director. I have a great program. Why in the world wouldn't a college want to hire me? You know, because you don't know that things like, well, a doctorate is just going to be a prerequisite for someone to earn tenure somewhere. So they don't want to hire you if you only have a master's degree. Will they? Sure. If you're a world-class musician and you, you know, you play with the New York Philharmonic or you, you know, you're the, the horn player in Rufus Reed's jazz quartet or whatever. Yeah, they, they'd hire you for that. If you're the high school band director in a small town in Southern Maine, no, they don't want to hire somebody with a master's degree because you won't earn tenure. And that means they're going to be hiring somebody else again in another X number of years. Um, but I got some good advice. I was fortunate to have done some work with uh, with Chris Azera, who uh, had taught at the Hart School for a long time, uh, and and then went back, as he calls it, you know, got called home to the mothership and went back to Eastman, where he had done uh, his his doctorate and his master's degree. Uh, worked with uh, Dick Gruno as well, who had been at Eastman for a long time, and I thought, gee, I really want to go there. And uh, so I applied. Uh, I was absolutely terrified because the school just has this reputation as being one of the most amazing musical centers. I and mean, this was where Fennell founded the wind ensemble movement. It was, um, 
you know, and applied thinking there's no way I'm going to get in here. This is it. And Chris was like, look, I, I, I'm the coordinator of the department and I'm telling you, we'd be interested in you. So I applied and I got in and wound up uh, leaving Sanford and renting my house at first because it was a terrifying move to say, no, I'm stepping away from financial security and everything else. And I'm, I'm going to move. I could, my family, like I said, I was four generations of teachers in Sanford. My family either retired or was wheeled from the building. And, you know, <laughs> nobody, nobody left Sanford. You got your gig there. That's where you're staying. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, moved out to Rochester and just found that to be a really, really transformative experience. Worked with a couple of doctoral students who had programs that I was just blown away by um, and worked with some professors who were really terrific. Uh, had the opportunity to do some uh, conducting work with Dr. Mark Scatterday and the, the Wind Orchestra, which is sort of the, the younger band at Eastman, um, which in and of itself is kind of a surreal experience because it's freshmen and sophomores. So in a first semester, everybody in the group's 18 or 19. They walk in and they look like your high school band. And then they sit down and they play like the Marine Band. It's just a, a scary, scary experience. And in that situation, you got to figure out, like, what do I bring to the table here? These kids are playing things like, you know, the suite of old American dances. And the, the established precedent is on the first rehearsal, everybody walks in and they can play all the notes and all the rhythms and all the dynamics. And there's good balance and the sense of style is there. And because everybody gets their parts beforehand and and the norm is well of course you go out and find recordings of these things and prep your parts but nobody goes to rehearsal unprepared this is this is a conservatory this is, and as a an old guy who's here because if i don't have some idea of what that is then i probably don't belong there and and in short term they'll be nice enough not to eat me alive but long term you're not going to get asked back if you're not doing something so um Great. you know it, that was really it, it was yet again another really transformative experience for me uh and then as i was sort of preparing to exit the program at eastman um this job opened at at westcon and uh i thought wow this is uh halfway back home for both my wife and I, this is, uh, you know, an hour and 15 minutes out of New York City. It's a really rich musical market. And then as I dug more into the program, you know, at the time, they had moved only like three or four years ago into a brand new $100 million facility that's dedicated just to music, visual art, and theater. Um, and I thought, gee, I know this area a little bit. One of my best friends growing up had lived in Bethel for a while. So I was, I remember the the Danbury Fair Mall when it wasn't a mall, it was a fair, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> and and so uh, it, it, it was, uh, it, you know, it was like, gee, I, I think most of this is going to, could be a really good situation. And I, I came here and yeah, I had a really wonderful time on campus and felt like, you know, if I don't get this job, that's okay, because I really represented myself mm -hmm. in in the best light. Um, and, you know, I can, I can say, at least from my end of things, I, I am thrilled to be here. This feels so comfortable. Uh, the, the school has a, a long history of preparing teachers in general. It was founded as a normal school in the late 1800s. Um, there have been uh, people teaching music here at least since the the 50s. Uh, I've been doing some digging back. Ruth uh, de Villafranca, who we now have an award that is named after her, uh, was a professor here in the 50s and helped prepare people to be music teachers even before there was officially a program of we prepare music teachers. It was just she was a part of the education department preparing people to be teachers in general. Um, and over time, it's really evolved into being one of the banner programs. We have just under 200 majors right now in the department. There are about 75 or 80 music education majors, two bands, two or three jazz ensembles, large jazz ensembles in any given semester, a full orchestra, three choirs, um, a lot of chamber ensembles. We do better than 100 performances in a year. It's, it's just, it's really sort of the, 
the perfect combination of all things. It's a sort of a mid-sized, small to mid-sized state university, 4,000, 4,500 students in total. Um, but proximity to the city means that a lot of our faculty are people who play in Broadway pits or I uh, you know, have a recently retired tuba teacher who spent more than 30 years as the tubist with Radio City. Um, people who've played with the American Brass Quintet or the Amer American Ballet Orchestra or that sort of thing. And that, that's just a depth that isn't normally present at a, a state university. And, right. uh, you yes. know, so I feel fortunate because I've walked into a program that was very successful at turning out quality teachers. And it's sort of been, a, okay, well, the I guess the mantle is being passed in some ways. And how do I not mess this up? <laughs> so... Uh, I'm sure uh, so that's kind of where I am. <laughs> Excellent. What I think is one of the most unique music methods programs that I've ever seen. Yeah. So um, we, in our upper level music education courses, and this was a this was a curveball for me because I had been familiar to places saying, "Well, your methods courses are like brass methods or choral," and we call those workshops here and there. They're sort of uh, lower level courses, but Every one of the music ed students comes through eight of those. So they get a course in vocal technique, in brass, in, in single read and double read, uh, guitar and ukulele, world music, percussion, and strings. And all of those happen prior to semester five when students go through a, a sort of a mock application process where they are essentially then welcomed into the upper level courses in music education. At that point, we take them through a couple semesters of uh, methods courses where they start to put pieces together for, you know, yes, you've had all these different classes. Let's talk about how you're going to be using all of that knowledge to then teach in, um, you know, in eventually in your own classes, but, you know, prepping to be ready to go student teach or even in our, our observation hours that go along with each of those methods courses, we encourage those students, as long as the cooperating teachers are comfortable with them teaching, helping out in classrooms, whether it's just I'm assisting with this, or in some cases, actually taking over and doing lessons, you know, themselves. Um, we work to try and give people an awful lot of opportunities to be doing mock teaching cycles. In all honesty, we we do three of those, even in intro to music ed in the first semester of of kids teaching, because we want them to get used to being up in front of people and delivering content. And at first, just being OK with that, like I don't have to refer to my notes all the time. I was supposed to say, wait, no. Um, oh, yeah, this was what I would because it's uncomfortable to do that at first. And it's a skill, even if you're introverted you figure out where you're going to get that teacher's mask and and you pull it on and and then eventually it feels less like a mask than just a part of who you are um so once we get them into the the methods courses um we really start to to mock that up we do our best to mock up classrooms for for some of the methods courses and then ensembles for the other methods courses and we start them on, on teaching cycles as soon as possible. And if we can find a way to make that happen four, five, six times a semester where every kid gets an opportunity to be up in front of what, a, you know, an orchestra playing grade one orchestra music, where most of the kids who are playing in the orchestra are not string primaries, and they're going to make the, the same mistakes that your fourth grader is going to make, um, you know, how do we get you through that? And how do we get you starting to feel comfortable knowing what to say and what to do with those things? Um, so that really has sort of become the, the focus of a lot of the work that gets done in all of those classes. And we build in little other things. Here's a thing from EdTPA that's a, a, a small side unit attached to this course or that course. So when they have to take and pass EdTPA to get a teacher certificate, they're not coming into it cold, but we really have worked hard not to remove a lot of the musical content because it's it's really unique. There are things that you get in a music education class that most people would not put the pieces together on if they had a music class and an ed class and then thought, well, how do we make those fit? It's just what we do 
as music teachers is unique enough that we really believe strongly in the fact that kids who are going to be the best music teachers probably get an awful lot more specifics about, A, we expect you to be a good musician, and, and we do our best not to draw lines between that. All the ed majors get the same lessons that performance majors would get at Westcon. Everybody's studying for an hour a week coming straight through, um, all the way through the program, seven semesters of that. They don't study when they're in student teaching. But aside from that, there's no differentiation. There are no ensembles on campus that are specific to performance majors. Um, and as a matter of fact, many, most of our section leaders in all the different ensembles, both instrumental and vocal ensembles, are oftentimes the ed majors. Uh, we really believe that if you're a good musician, you're bringing the first thing to the table that you need to bring in order to be a good music teacher. Um, and then, uh, you know, really working to try and bring in things from a, a pedagogy aspect where you talk about, well, how do people really learn music? So that what you're talking about isn't just do that again. But it's what can you, you know, what is it that they're missing out of this that's keeping them from being able to, to achieve what you're asking them to do? And if it's just a technique issue, the fingers aren't going to the right place at the right time, then again, it's probably the right thing that they need. And give them two or three or four times to do that pretty quickly, because all they're trying to do is a physical action. But if you're trying to ask them to do something different and they're not hearing something, then again, isn't going to solve that problem, at least not in the most efficient manner. So let's start digging in on that. And in our, in our, our methods classes, we really try to build in a fair amount of lab time so that it can be, well, what's your thought on that? I can give you some suggestions. Does anyone else have a suggestion on that? Um, and the, the methods classes are taught by a fairly diverse group of people. So our elementary methods course is taught by someone who is currently uh, actually a middle school choir director, but who spent better than a decade as an elementary general music teacher. She knows the program well. She knows her pedagogy really well. She's got some background in ORF. She's got some background in Kodai. And that course really becomes very much a lab course also where everybody comes in. And today we're all kindergartners. And so you're going to channel your best kindergartner. And I'm going to take you through some activities so that when you're going out, you, you've got activities to put in your bag of tricks because that's probably the first thing that most teachers are going to care about in their first year or two. I just got to have stuff to do with the kids. Yeah. And we, we do our best to expose the kids over time to a pretty consistent framework of this is how you learn music as a human being. This is how we process this stuff out. But then talking about like, all right, well, what are the things you can do with younger kids? When do you want to transition away from saying, I go, you go, let me rote teach? Because there's some good stuff about rote teaching. You know, you absolutely should be rote teaching when they're young. And you absolutely need to know when not to be doing that, because I don't want to rote teach my symphonic band a whole suite. That's inefficient from day one. So how do you start transitioning out of those things? And, and when we work to give the kids a lot of that kind of stuff, there's also an instrumental and a choral methods course, which is, it, it's a required choice for our, our majors. So you can choose one or the other. You gotta take one. Almost, I would say somewhere in any given semester between 85 and 100% of the kids choose to take both because we've really worked hard to say, you know, Dr. Wiggins might be doing something in choral methods and you're going, well, that's choral methods. But his approach to teaching something might be a lot more inspired than my approach to teaching that same issue is. He might have a way of approaching rhythm that just really clicks for you. And if you can see him teaching something in choral methods, in all honesty, once you get beyond the technique of what's producing the sound, there's way more similarities to what all music directors do than there are differences. And so, um, you know, we approach everything from everybody's going to sing. It's the first instrument you've got on the podium if you're a director I, I don't bring my trumpet to rehearsal with me every day to play stuff for the kids if i need more from the trombones or i need to sing them you know demonstrate a line i'm going to sing it to them so we try and encourage everybody to use that not that you are an astounding vocalist with just you know glittering technique 
but that you can feel comfortable using your voice and singing a line to kids and, and doing a good job with that stuff. Um, we also really encourage all of our, uh, our choral primary students to pick up an instrument or two or three or four um, and, and come and play it in an ensemble. Uh, we have uh, one jazz combo that is specifically designed for people who have never played jazz before and in some cases have not really played the instrument that they're playing very much before. Um, and it, you know, typically they'll even play a tune or two at one of the, the department convocations or something like that. But it's, it's a good thing because it's taking the kids through the process and it's yep. saying, look, this is, you know, jazz is not really a different language. It's more like a different dialect but we can teach you all of that stuff. So that's a very teachable skill. And if you're gonna be a music teacher, it's it's really frankly an important skill to have. So let's give you a real and a meaningful experience with it. Um, and then I think one of the most unique things that we actually have going on with our methods courses is, uh, and this may have come from back in the day when you were working here, um, uh, there was a gentleman, Wes Ball, who was the coordinator of music education at the time, uh, and he wound up designing a middle level music course. So we, it's the one place in our department where we really sort of start dealing with, you know, this animal that is the middle school student. And, you know, we talk about this, you know, either six through eight or five through eight is sort of where most people conceive of middle school being, but that these kids have one foot that's firmly planted in, I am a, I am still a child. I am still at, at heart kind of narcissistic, not because I have to be, but just because I, I'm still concrete and I can't completely get out of that. And then one foot that's very rapidly moving toward, oh no, I'm an adult. You need to treat me like an adult. I, and yet, you know, still very much wants to like, oh, well, you know, I'd love to have somebody tell me a story. That's great. That's, you know, so they are very definitely one part little kid and one part emerging adult. And, you know, everything from a standpoint of, neurological development to social emotional learning you got to take those kids wherever they are and you've got to meet them and you've got to treat them as kids and you've got to get that interest where I, i'm engaging with them and and boy if you can do that you're a pretty magical person because you can be super successful as a middle school educator so so that course really we we try and use it so that people understand first and foremost what are the challenges of working with middle school kids? Because they really are that one half little kid and one half emerging adult. And, and what are the things that are going to work a lot with them? It allows us in the program to really, from a, a music focused perspective, talk about social emotional learning, doing those kinds of things, just building connections with the kids, which you know is crucial in middle school education. But in all honesty, it's crucial at most levels, certainly from middle school on up you establish a relationship with the students that you're teaching. And then I, I mean this in the, the least creepy way possible, but that relationship really becomes the foundation for everything. Uh, you know, the students, you know, if you're doing a really good job at this, if you're doing it right, you, uh, this is going to go totally creepy. And I'm sorry about this. It's almost like you're a cult leader, like people, they, they want to be there. They care about you as a person, as a teacher, and they will work hard for you. And I don't mean that I try and feed that. Like, I, I try and feed their own autonomy. Like, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you love this. Let's keep growing these skills. Yes, you want to be a better musician, because if you're a better musician, you'll be a better teacher. You'll, the, you know, the pay it forward thing is always happening in all of that. But teaching them in a, in a, serious manner like i am dedicating actual class time to this here are ways you can build good relationships with your students because at the middle school level it is absolutely vital if they don't dig what you're doing and you're teaching an elective class your program's going to fall apart oh I, I, I agree with you. i agree 100 percent. the interesting thing is that when i taught middle school the thing that i always felt was that if you taught a concept to the kids and the next day they came back and did it. You, as a teacher, you got your rewards very quickly on, on doing, and you and you you had to work at being a Pied Piper, just as you said, not the creepy thing, but the Pied Piper of leading them. And 
if we look at when you then become a high school band director, you're always looking to your feeder program, your middle school. And if you've got a middle school music teacher who's a Pied Piper and just leads these kids through, they lead them right to your high school program as well. And Absolutely. it goes elementary to middle, middle, to, and a great program is one where the level of balance of the middle school to, uh, pardon me, the elementary school to the middle school to the high school is so important. So I didn't mean to drop, but I just wanted to reinforce what you're saying that it is 100% true. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, for musical content in that class, uh, you know, typically there's uh, always, 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 that's the place where the, the vocal or choral person who's a part of the team that teaches this course will do a whole thing on the changing voice because it's, it's something that choir directors deal with everywhere. Where are you going to talk about it? Because if you don't, your kids are coming out of school not knowing what they should be doing when they're dealing with kids who are going through the vocal change. Right. Um, in in the, the instrumental side of things, um, you know, it's a good opportunity to talk about sort of the transition out of the beginning band book or the beginning strings book to, you know, we've gone from just uh, this is more so group lessons to now you've got ensembles that are forming and how do you choose literature for them and how are you appropriately finding stuff that the kids are going to like and that, you know, that will help them grow the skills that are really requisite for them to continue growing and succeeding as they progress through whatever program they're in. And it also has, as of late, because we're always looking at what are schools looking to hire, what are, you know, what's happening in the general world of music education and things are evolving out. Um, that middle level methods class for us has been a place where we start talking about the modern band movement and teaching rock band stuff and, and all of that kind of thing where I'll just essentially take the kids, pluck them into two or three groups randomly and say, you know, you're going to play, they've taken the guitar and ukulele workshop. They've had percussion workshop. They've had keyboard classes. You know, you may get uh, into a situation where at the high school you're teaching, you're going to have to teach a unit in modern band. How are you going to do something that's musically meaningful here? And I just toss it to them and, and just try and again, give them a pathway on all of this stuff, because it is a direction that some schools are moving in and moving in heavily. And we don't want to be left behind, essentially, in that. And uh, I would say the university program as a whole has been moving in that direction. We have a couple of modern bands that are a part of our, our regular ensemble curriculum now, where people are doing essentially rock band stuff, and they're covering Eagles tunes or Yes tunes or any of that kind of stuff. Um, where we don't specifically do a unit in this, uh, but music tech is another very emerging sector in, in the music ed world. And we're fortunate because the second largest program in the music department at Westcon is an audio and, uh, uh, audio and music. I'm going to biff the wording on this audio and music production program. And so there are all kinds of coursework that the students can take from a, just a general overview in music tech to recording technologies and mixing and all kinds of stuff like that that are taught by people, in all honesty, there are a couple of people who are Emmy Award winners who teach here because, again, we're just up the road from a really big market for all of that. And so people can take a course with somebody who might have been writing for one of the daytime drama shows or could do a rock band thing with somebody who was on the road with Carol King or James Taylor, or I mean, it just proximity makes all of those things possible. And while the production thing isn't specifically a part of our music ed program, I would say probably 40 to 50% of our kids will take at least something in that so that they're generally exposed to it as well. Uh, and we really try to, to, you know, to take that middle level class and fill in a lot of gaps, I guess, for lack of a better term. There's not a good place to talk about X. Maybe we could do that in here. Um, the, the other thing that I would say we really have going for us is we've now added a third day to a required time that our department calls convocation. It's time for uh, you know student recitals or faculty recitals. Sometimes there's master class things where like all the brass students will meet together and one of the brass students is going to be playing and another two are going to be doing critiques or talking about how you would teach. Um, 
because the music ed program has such a significant history in the university, most of our studio faculty um, will use that time to talk about, well, what, what are you teaching in private lessons as like an advanced, with an advanced level student? But it's, again, that's more teaching cycles. If you're a high school band director, what are you doing with your flute player who might be auditioning for Allstate if you're not a flute player? You're probably not giving her an awful lot of technique, but you could very well be giving an awful lot of musical feedback on ways to let a line grow. How do you, how do you add your, you know, how are you going to set yourself aside from others as a player? And that becomes another really good place to make that happen. Recently, we added a third day, and all the music ed students go to that as music ed lab, and all the audio students go to that as audio lab. And it allows us time to meet, whether it's with the school's NAFME chapter, ACDA chapter, ASTE, uh, ASTA chapter, any of those kinds of things. But it also gives uh, us an opportunity. So like last semester, I had four meetings of a lab orchestra. And it was for anybody who had taken our string workshop class who could have available a, a string instrument of some sort. And we had a, a beginning orchestra with five cellos and two basses and some violas and some violins. And we played grade one and one and a half literature. But, you know, four or five days of needing to play that stuff makes you start to go, hey, I, I can do this. And if I need to be the person... district and they say, well, like, we need you to teach two sections of strings. It's not, it's not terrifying. This is something that I've done before. And again, helps them to start to see the connections. There's an awful lot more, you know, what band and orchestra directors do that's similar than it is different. You just need to learn to wrestle with a different, a different thing that you're playing on. And so we've worked to, to grow that. This semester, I'm doing six classes on teaching jazz to everybody. And Great. just, you know, it's, it's an extra hour that officially the, the kids don't get credit for, but they're also not being charged for it. And, and it's a shot for me to go, I don't, we don't have a class yet in like, uh, you know, jazz pedagogy that's for ed majors. We have a good jazz ped class for our jazz studies kids. Um, but it's also a bear. Like if you're joining that class, you want to have some pretty serious chops on your primary instrument. You're going to learn a lot about how you teach it. You're going to learn a lot about jazz improvisation if you take the jazz improv class for majors. But you're going to bust your tail getting through all of that stuff. And so I try to approach the whole thing from, okay, if I've got a group of fifth and sixth graders and I'm trying to teach them, uh, you know, the first bits about how to play swing or what's the blues. How am I going to do that? And, uh, you know, it, it sort of gives us a little bit of a sandbox to play around with some different ideas. And I mean, my down the road goal is to try and grow those into having some sort of a teaching jazz workshop, some sort of a, a one credit workshop class in doing a, a lot of stuff with marching band techniques, because it's not something that everybody's going to do. But there are four or five schools within an hour of here that are you know, heavy hitters in the world of, of marching band. A lot of our kids, because we don't have a marching band at the university, will come in and, and be looking at other schools in the area that still march and say, well, gee, you know, I really might like to continue marching. So that, that's great. If that's what you want to do, then it's good that you know that you can prioritize that. If you're really interested in teaching in the marching activity, I can tell you, we've got a lot of collect connections with a lot of schools in the area. And a lot of our kids who really enjoy the marching activity wind up going out and getting an opportunity to start teching drills somewhere, start working with, a, you know, with, as a brass instructor, as a woodwind instructor, as a percussion instructor. And then they wind up continuing on into doing uh, winter percussion. I get two people right now who are instructing winter percussion at two different school districts in the area. And... Um, you know, as opposed to, a, oh, well, they'll figure it out if they're going to get there or, oh, no, we don't really do anything with that. My goal is to try and say, look, there are, there are better and worse ways to be teaching and approaching that activity. And we ought to be teaching that, even if it only winds up being a course that runs once every four semesters. At some point through a, through a, a trip through our university, you'd have an opportunity to take that if you want to do it. 
and we'll help get you there in maybe a little bit more informed manner. So That's great. Um, and, and that extra time gives us a place to start rolling some of those things out. Um, Chip Gall and I did a whole thing on two different approaches to teaching marching because he had taught at Wilton High School for a long time. Um, and Wilton did the, you know, like, changing shows every week and, uh, you know, show band style stuff. So it wasn't really the, the competitive thing that most of the kids who have done marching in this area have gotten, but it was a, uh, well, let's let Mr. Gall tell you about the stuff that he was doing that he was very successful at in his school. And then I was able to bring some of my experience from Sanford and talking about, you know, these are things that we would work on doing. Here are things that are absolutes, you know, if if you're the only music teacher in a school and your principal comes forward and says, we want you to start a marching band program, there are important questions to ask about budget and about scheduling and about staffing and about, because if you're the only person, you know, just start scheduling your counseling sessions now, because that's not a one person job. And you need to find a way to explain that to people in a manner that says, if you're really interested in this, we can do some good stuff, but we really need to be serious about what what it requires right and then Most so yeah that's great so you know you've you've touched about about everything that we were going to talk about about the uniqueness of westcon and the uniqueness of the methods program what mm -hmm. other degrees does western connecticut offer in the area of music so we we offer a bachelor of music in performance in several different Right. They're, they're really sort of just like sort of subparts of the degree. You can do it in classical instrumental study, jazz instrumental study, classical voice, jazz voice. Um, but those are all essentially a bachelor of music in performance. Uh, two of them would be called a bachelor of music in jazz studies, but they're really performance based degrees. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, bachelor of music in audio and music production is the fastest growing of the the programs here, the new facility has just helped allow that to explode. So we have um, a recording studio that that is just outrageous. Uh, you know, the the soundboard is the size of a queen size bed. It's just, it, you know, I walk in there and I go, I know nothing about any of this, but wow, it's cool. Um, but the programs that, the, you know, the projects that the kids wind up doing in that program are just outrageous. A lot of them do their own writing last year I, I played on a couple recordings um that were for a film scoring project where the kids got like a four and a half minute film and they had to compose original music to go with the, and they they did all that coursework through their classes and then we got a group of students and faculty together into the studio everybody's in there percussionists are in isolated sound booths everybody's got the the headphones on with you know and we sit down and record through the music with the student who wrote it, actually having the experience of conducting that through, and then they they put it all together. Um, we have feeds from both the regular theater, which is a full proscenium type theater or the theater program, as well as from the concert hall, which is um, which is also my rehearsal room. It, it's it's just a jaw-droppingly beautiful place. It has phenomenal acoustics. And um, because the symphonic band is the largest group on campus, that is the space that it fits in. So twice a week, we rehearse in our performance space. Um, but there are feeds that come out of both of those rooms that go into that studio so that anything we wind up doing can be recorded there. There is also... a uh, an isolated booth in the upper part of that concert hall. Uh, and we just, we actually just had Richard Stoltzman, the clarinetist in doing a recording session there. Uh, there's a, a couple of uh, professional recording tech people who have worked in the hall and just say, this is the nicest and most affordable hall in the New York area. So I'm booking people in here. So when we go into like, breaks between uh semesters or the summer break oftentimes we get you know grammy award winners <laughs> high-end people in the world of music who wind up coming here to record for a day or two um just because of the facility so the the audio um the audio program really benefits a lot from that kind of stuff 
Um, we have a Bachelor of Arts in Music, which is it's the the lightest degree that we have from a, a standpoint of musical requirements. But it's it's a you know it's a wonderful liberal arts degree. It offers you access to all of the music courses that the department offers, and and really anything. Some of the upper level courses in each of the individual programs would be listed as you have to be a major or you have to have permission of the instructor. And we have music ed kids who take some of our advanced courses because they're interested in wanting to do music therapy. And so like elementary methods and or middle level methods might be a great place for them to get some extra stuff that when they're applying to uh, you know, a master's degree in music therapy, it's helpful in, 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 those, in those senses. Um, all of our ensembles are actually open to anyone across campus. So even, you know, the 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 top select choir, even the the wind ensemble, which is an audition only group, you don't have to be a music major to play in any of those. I, you know, I had a principal trumpet player in my ensemble uh, who was a meteorology major. Another one who was a history major, who, you know, who is now in a PhD program at Brandeis, um, but a burning player. I mean, just played the heck out of everything. So we, uh, you know, we have some some good opportunities for for lots of people, and and you know, love getting a chance to to speak with people, especially from out of state. You know, to try and you know wave the flag. I, I think that there's some great stuff that goes on here musically, and I I like sharing that with people. Well, thank you. Don't you also have a uh, stellar graduate school program for music education? So we actually, that's been, it is in the process of being reinvented. Um, so we had uh, a, a really solid music ed uh, master's degree that happened in summers and evenings. So that for practicing educators in the area, this was, you know, it was really one of the go-to uh, programs and, and certainly the most affordable. Um, and then uh, we've been looking at trying to roll out several other degrees. And so in order to in order to make all of the numbers work, which is always one of the problems in higher ed, um, there, th there has been a lot of work done in like, oh, uh, we'd love to take a look at a master's in this thing or that thing or and finding sort of these core classes could work for any of them. And then there are specialized courses that are going out from there. And we're in the process on getting all of that through governance. So we're hopeful that that will be rolling out again, maybe even, you know, this summer or by the fall, um, you know, in a sort of a reimagined um, you know, format. But, um, but it, it, that's still just sort of in process. It's, you know, gone through a lot of the stuff here on campus, but it has to clear us and go all the way up through Hartford and get all the approvals and all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted before we can roll it out. So in progress and hopefully soon. That'd be great. Well, you yeah. know, from the standpoint of the Growing Band Director podcast, the one thing that we talk about is teaching techniques, but today's episode has been about how to get our teachers to grow and also to advise our, in a roundabout way, our high school teachers that Here's a great university, Western Connecticut State University in Danbury, Connecticut, that can offer an opportunity for students to develop as music education managers and become teachers at a reasonable cost, mm -hmm. close to New York City and close to Hartford and um, with a fabulous staff. So I thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye? The one thing that I would add to what you just said was actually, because I, I think we don't do a good enough job of telling everybody this, and I know it's less pertinent uh, where you're sort of up in the northern New England area, but we are now offering in-state Connecticut tuition to all students from New York and New Jersey. And uh, like the building that I'm sitting in right now is less than two and a half miles to the New York state border. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, so if anybody's hearing this, especially if you're a band director in, in New York or New Jersey, and you've got students who are looking at universities, we offer in-state tuition to all, all students from New York and New Jersey as well. So That's fabulous. And it's a <laughs> as a former band director in Connecticut for quite a long time, 
I will tell you that one of my favorite places to send students was to Western Connecticut State University, and then watching them come out and become great teachers. And if you look at um, four of the high school band direct, no wait, four, five, six, seven, eight of the high school band directors in the Fairfield County area, they are all graduates of Western Connecticut State University. Mm -hmm. And you guys should be very proud of that. They've, uh, you've done a wonderful job to nurture music education and expand upon it. And you do one other thing that you and Laura showed it to do a great job, and that is um, staff development or music development for music educators on their days off, which I think is a wonderful thing because you're still trying to take that diet that you gave them let them go out and mull it around teaching a little while and then come back and talk about it. How can we make this even better? Yeah. I, you know, just from a personal perspective, I think I would probably be on the downside of a career and kind of meh happy had I simply stayed doing what I was doing. Everybody's got to have a plan. You got to grow. You're going to evolve. And it doesn't mean that the work that you're doing or that you're starting to feel meh about is not worthwhile or noble work, but it's also got to feed your own sense of musicality and your own sense of, of interaction and autonomy. And, you know, having that plan, how am I growing? How am I evolving is important. And, and it's important that, that we don't just dictate everybody should do this, but, but be a resource for people be, because that's what a state university should be. How are we, you know, how is everybody able to grow their game and how can we help and be a part of that well i i thank you very much and would it be all right if some of our listeners reach out to me for your email address to share it so that they could ask you questions absolutely I, i'm i'm even happy to give it on here uh it's d-o-i-r-o-n-m so my last name and then first initial at wcsu.edu and uh I'd be happy to chat with any of anyone about anything music education related, uh, you know, always looking to build better bridges, better connections, <laughs> ways to chase down missing parts to band literature when I'm getting ready to hand something, I, you know, anything like that. It's just uh, our network is, is super important. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to be as supportive as I can to anybody else because that also supports me. You know, we're all better for working together. Well, Matt, thank you very much. And give my best to all my friends at Western Connecticut. And, and have a great day. Thanks, Jeff. You as well. Give my best to everybody in the Wind Symphony and in New Hampshire and Maine. I, 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 I cherish those times. They are wonderful people. Good stuff happens there because of all the work they do. And we had a great time being with you as well. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.